Um, so at the beginning of the year, we went to one of these, one of our trainings, and we always know that our ELs, our EB population is pretty, pretty substantial, usually around 40%. And so this year we looked and we discovered that it was 45%. And then when I broke it down by class, I noticed that 67% of those, uh, or well, 67% of our sixth grade class were, were labeled EL or EB. EB. And I think after that, then we just started looking at like um, for like individualized needs. We look at um, the test. We go into aware, and so we look at sixth grade English and see, you know, how each teacher's EB students are performing compared to the rest. And if there's a bigger gap, then that's kind of what I think. Well, we start at teachers first, and then we go to classes. And so, say like our sixth grade class, we go there and see, you know, what is it? So if everybody's scoring around fifty three. And then our emergent bilinguals are at 52, we're okay. But if our emergent bilinguals are scoring at like 42, we know there's a huge gap there. We're like, how can we best support that teacher? And then what can we do with that? And even when it's not like a huge gap, because I think kind of beginning of the year, we're looking at more like 10%, mm -hmm. yeah. something like that gap between our general population and our EB kids, um, which doesn't seem huge. But when you're talking about 45% of your kids, yeah. that's, those that's are big huge. numbers. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's kind of how we decided that mm -hmm. needed to be a focus and um, how we wanted to kind of attack mm -hmm. it along with our wonderful coach. Yeah. So we've asked Adrian to come in and observe teachers um, first, start by doing that. Actually, we had her come in first and kind of just hang out and build a little bit of a relationship mm -hmm. with teachers first. Um, get to know them a little bit uh, in PLC and then also individually on their conference period and, and then kind of ask, hey, would you be all right with me coming and observing you, giving you some feedback? And then that's something she started doing, coming in, observing teachers, giving them some feedback on some supports that they could give and then debriefing with mm -hmm. us afterward as well as us debriefing with the teacher or her debriefing mm -hmm. with the teacher. So um, it's been a pretty structured process, which I think has worked uh, uh, really well. Um, PLC wise, um, she's done some trainings in PLC, uh, different strategies on how to uh, scaffold for EBs and then follow up with that. So a lot of the stuff that she's doing in PLCs we're also presenting mm -hmm. in PLCs. Also those are the things she's talking about when she goes in and observes teachers and uh, gives them feedback. Like, what I really like doing was taking like again going back to that data looking at it and looking at the teachers like okay who needs a little bit more support and then breaking it down by class and then i was like okay so this teacher right here she is doing a great job with her kids she's wonderful she built a relationship it's just her esl you know her eb kids need a little bit more support especially in this class and then i was like hey can you go into that class period and um but first i would ask before we before i would um just point to there, I would definitely go to the teacher first and said, you know, what do you think about this? I noticed that you're, you know, you have a lot of EBs. It's hard. A lot of our campuses or a lot of our classes are sheltered. And so just, you know, acknowledging that it is a really, you know, hard demographic at times to teach, especially in ELAR when that's their biggest weakness. And so just asking, you know, would you, would you like some feedback? All she's going to do is just look at that. And I think that's a definite thing that you've worked with me on is just, it's not about like this teacher needs help. It's like, hey, the kids in this teacher's class need help because they're struggling with language. And so always framing it like that because we want our teachers to feel safe and want you know them to always want to come to us, but definitely to use you. Uh, one thing that we've definite, or we've used a lot is our one of our teams. I felt like all of us came together to just really tighten that team. Yeah, and just really reinforcing what they've learned from her mm -hmm. afterward with yeah. the training that we do with them. So, mm -hmm. you know, being really aware of what it is that Adrian's bringing and then trying to mm -hmm. reinforce that uh, throughout the year. And I think that's been one of the things that's made a huge difference at this campus um, is our relationship and how mm -hmm. you guys carry on the work even after I leave. And we talk about that, you know, I'm like, I'm seeing this need with this brand new baby teacher with um, her, her e, you know, her EB kids or it's a little big group in that one class. It's a little tough. Can you go see that? Or can you go watch um, the support that is being given and can you help with that support? And, um, so, and I think, too, just when we do our instructional walks, you know, 
we're always looking for, you know, how can we support these teachers, mm -hmm. and especially our, our shelter teachers, and thinking about, okay, this is what this teacher does really well, you know, that aligns with our vision, like mm -hmm. you mentioned, but I'm noticing maybe the scaffolds aren't in place. If we could just get that part, this teacher would be mm -hmm. great. And those are things we talk about when mm -hmm. we meet uh, with Adrian. Well, and I think, and the other thing is that a lot of those we try to, we try to find new people too that can meet with Adrian, but we definitely keep those relationships sustained because those relationships are built too. So not only is our relationship really strong, we try to make sure that your relationship with teachers are strong too, because then that trust is built and then that can just kind of trickle out more and you can have more relationships with teachers. Well, what we really started with the whole process was we do these instructional walks. And so our principal, Mr. Drysdale, takes me and him and sometimes some of our IPs and we do instructional walks. And then what first like month of doing this, we just kind of noticed that was kind of our problem of practice was that our kids were not talking as much as they should be. And so... Um, Which is an and, even bigger problem for our EV kids. Yes, cause yes. That's, and, you know, that's been our struggle, especially in getting them released from the program, is they don't do well in the speaking and listening part. Mm. They can read just fine, they can write just fine, for the most part. But the thing that's really mm -hmm. been holding them back the last few years has been the, the listening and speaking. Mm -hmm. So, like she mm -hmm. said, we we noticed that they weren't doing a whole lot of it in class, yeah. in our instructional rounds, in, in some classes. Being, they sometimes, even though we're not administrators, they still sometimes see us that way. And so you're just a lot safer and so they can let down their guard. They can be more vulnerable with you. And you're not going to be like, oh, hey, they're not doing this. You're going to be like, okay, well, that's all. thanks for letting me know. Let's let's try this now. Um, I, I think one big thing that we've noticed, um, we've been working on the strategy of Pat List, like a big thing that you brought. Um, and I think before that, in, in a lot of areas, teachers were – when they'd give kids something to read, it's like they just give it to them and they expect them to understand it and they weren't really scaffolding it. But mm -hmm. now that, you know, you showed them how to do the pat list, you've modeled it in classes, yeah. we've shown them how to do yeah. it. Uh, we do it all the time in our faculty meetings. Yeah. Um, they're really buying into that and we're seeing a lot of use of that strategy and I think it's paying off. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that it's not that they didn't they I just don't think they need knew a way to do it and I think the pat list that you brought us was just a very accessible easy way for them to chunk and chew and break down text and ask questions and have kids you know discuss their problems or discuss the you know answers and questions and stuff like that as they go I know that definitely our ELA that you know I talked to them and they are just like well the great thing is it's not only do you bring these great things because it's not just reading, writing, listening, speaking, you bring in content specific stuff with organizers and anything that helps ELAR and they just love it. You know, so it's, again, it's not just you, it's what you do with them. And then we're on the same team, but then our teachers are taking it and giving it, you mm -hmm. know? Yeah, and we're seeing a lot more, you know, conversation between kids and collaboration mm -hmm. in classrooms oh, that than, is... than we did at the beginning of the year. So. I think one way that we were really lucky to have you is working with um, the team of teachers and you're just able to ask questions and make them think that way. And so then they're able to carry it on. And so that's something that they've been able to tell us too. Like, yeah, now that when we're, even when she's not there, we ask questions and we look, okay, so this is the lesson you brought. Okay, so what are the scaffolds for ES, you know, for EB kids? And they were saying, like, at the beginning, it wasn't like that. And so because, you know, like, whatever you bring to, like, our ELR department or to our new teachers, we're able to figure out how to scaffold for, you know, social studies, science, and math. So we're excited about that continuation of that work.